Welcome aboard the Par Train. My name is Ev. This is Serm. We are here today to break down 10 ways to play your best golf in 2024. We're going to recap our favorite 10 sound bites from an entire year of our podcast in 2023. Um, if you guys are new, we help frustrated golfers enjoy the ride again because if you can learn to smile through bad golf, you can smile through anything. And if you guys like this episode, hop aboard the Par Train channel now. And uh, sir, what do they got to do in 2024? Just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride, guys. Take care. This is a tradition unlike any other, right? The top 10, Heard right? As we look back um, at the entire year and just like all these great interviews. And man, when I get, when I put my five together, I told you I was fired up. I was just fired up. So let's, uh, let's dive into it, Ev. Okay. So episode 221 with Parker McLaughlin, January 14th. Oh, okay. Shit. Let's play the clip. My rehearsal stroke. I would take it looking at the hole yeah. so that I wouldn't then get ball bound. I wouldn't get stroke bound. I wouldn't be analyzing, oh, that stroke went too far inside. Oh, that stroke went too far outside. Mm. I, w- I was l- looking at the hole, really feeling what this was about to feel like, trying to measure it up with my feels and not then getting too far into left brain where I was fears, doubts, too many thoughts, too many checklists, too many, um, you know, too many left brain thoughts, w- which would which would really hinder my creativity. And so I would never really be looking down at my putter thinking, oh, my grip pressure is too tight. Oh, I need to loosen it. Oh, um, I just took that one too far on the outside. Ooh, my face looks shut going back. Any of those thoughts completely throw you, they throw you off of the ability to, to make a free, creative, athletic stroke. What did you like about it? Why did you pick it? You know, I've, that was such a great episode. I mean, we've had him on a couple of times. Parker's, you know, been a bit of a game changer, I would say, in the short game world. Um, teaching a lot of pros, but that one connected me immediately Ev, because th- this idea really helped me as a junior golfer, um, a sports psychologist that I had seen a couple of times named Jeff Fishbein. Um, mm. He put this idea in my head that I've implemented. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's what he's saying, looking at the hole. So taking a couple of practice strokes before you put it and looking at the hole, and then for me, seeing the ball go in those last two, three feet, but getting away and right and getting that feel and getting that visualization as opposed to, you know, just constantly, you know, head over the ball, looking down. I was, that's what I was doing from my practice strokes. And then I put that change into play. And I just think that's so good. I've because, um, you know, it gets away from mechanics, gets right into feel, gets right into the, you know, visualization and ultimately freeing up the tension, right? Um, it's so easy to get <laughs> so tension fill, filled in the game with your swing, but also in putting, especially on a putt that's downhill or got a lot of break. And um, so I just, I just, I can picture Parker doing it, just looking at the hole, making, eff- you know, making really kind of free effortless practice strokes um, and then just seeing it go in. And hitting the pot. So it was, it connected me with me as a junior. It really did. It's really helped me. I do, I've done it ever since. Um, and I know when I start getting in trouble is when I'm too focused at looking down at my, my stance, right. Mm-hmm. Or my grip or, um, where my hands position might be, um, as I get over a pot. So just great connection from a short game chef. What do you think? Yeah, that's great. Um, and also Brett, you can edit this out. You're a little loud when you're pretty close to the mic. Okay. This is an FYI. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, what, what have we heard a million times, whether it's been on this podcast or in golf content in general, I've, I've seen videos from Parker and we've had conversations on this podcast that basically says something of the sense of if you're thinking about your stroke, you're probably not putting well. And second, you stop thinking about your stroke. You tend to putt better counterintuitive but it's true right and that has been really true for me like over this past year of having probably the worst ball striking of my life my putting 
is the one thing I had consistent visualization on and it felt creative. Like I had to feel it, see it going in. And then I just match, I paint that picture. I match the picture that I saw. Right. And you make putts, but oh, I wasn't yeah. you trying had, to you make solid putts. putts. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, I think, I'm glad you started with this again. I didn't know what you picked, but I think this is a cool one to start with because it's so much bigger than putting. Right. Right. Well, yeah. And I love about it, Ev, it, it's really something you can implement. Anybody can say to you, Hey, work on, you got to be good at visualization. You got to be smooth and tension free with your shoulders. Okay, great. Well, how do I do that? And when you're over, when you're over the ball, looking at the hole, that that's what that frees everything up. Um, and so I love that you can, you guys listen, put that into practice, right? Stop doing practice strokes with your head down the whole time over the ball. Look at the hole and yeah. <laughs> feel what's going on. So yeah, I know it's really connected for you to have, yeah, I love that. Uh, like you said, putting's putting's has helped your game. That so. might've been the first time Parker came on the show. Cause I know he came on again. It was just the yips. Yeah. I think that was his first time. That was the first episode on the show. Cool. All right. This is episode 239 with Maria Fossey. Um, We did this April 30th. This is a really cool one for me because through our partnership with TaylorMade, I got to go to an LPJ event and interview her in person. I got to see Emma Talley, who is a part train alum. She came up, gave me Heard a big hug. And it made me realize we need to do more with the LPGA. Um, but here's the sound bite, and then we'll talk through it a little bit more. And I think for me, like, whenever I just kind of let go of, of the stigma of what are you doing here or like you shouldn't be here or you're not good enough to be here. It's like, no, hold on. Like I am, yeah. you yeah. know, like I, I really am good enough to be here and, and I've shown myself that I am. So you're uh, moving out of doubt into belief it, yeah. and confidence. Be like even if you don't in, feel it, it yes, you're reminding just yourself really of it. telling myself that. Cause yeah. again, like I think so many times you, you don't, feel that way but but I think I, you have to be reminded of that and, yeah. and I think for for us uh, I have an amazing support system behind me like of course starting with my family and and closest friends but my coaching staff and uh, my Kyrie in in the course and, and that's like his biggest job yeah and and the thing he has to repeat the most is like hey dude like you're damn good. Like, let's go. It's just like I said before, like, let's just go play golf and, and it's going to be okay. Why this one? I picked this one because I think it's pretty telling if one of the hottest players that come out on the PG LPGA tour, um, she kind of burst on the scene, right? She was played in the inaugural um, Augusta women's amateur at Augusta national before uh, the Masters. Um, I think she played really well in her first major, you know, um, played really well in the Olympics, her first Olympics. So we kind of talked about that. And I think it's really eye opening that the number one job for her caddy is to remind her that she's good enough. And I was thinking about this one a lot last night, Serm. I think it's easy for us as amateur golfers, the passengers listening to think it makes sense why she could have confidence. It makes sense why I wouldn't, but I actually think the pros might have it tougher than us sometimes because we get wrapped up in our identity based on our golf game. But imagine if it actually was your job. Imagine if it literally determined whether or not you put food on the table um, and things you could buy and places you could go was totally reliant on your golf. And imagine, because you can relate to this, I can't, but you can. Imagine you played since you were three years old and everybody knew you as the good golfer. And then imagine you go to a tour event and you can't find the face, right? And you're going to talk about Jared Steger. He chunked his driver 
on the Canadian tour, chunked drivers, right? We've heard all of it. Everyone has struggled in their own way. I actually think this idea of everyone has doubt, no one's immune to it, but you have to talk yourself into feeling a little bit less doubt and a little bit more confident. There, there's no such thing as, it's not one or the other. It's like a dominant, non-dominant hand. I'm not a, I'm not just a righty. I can do stuff with my left hand, but my right hand's dominant. I think that's how I think about doubt versus confidence. It's always going to be there, but how can we remind ourselves of the stuff we do well? How can we choose to act as if we're going to hit a good one? Now, I know that's easier said than done. I know that as well as anyone, but I will tell you, there are moments of me on camera where I couldn't hit the driver all day long and someone egged me on like at Terra Edi, and I finally actually loaded my body and actually tried to swing aggressive um, and not tentative and I had my first good drive of the day, right? So yeah. it is a little bit of cart before the horse, but it really works that way. Like you can actually talk yourself into better golf as crazy as that sounds. And, uh, you know, I think well, that's, hearing pros talk about struggle is, yeah. is important. Yeah, no, I think that's great. That's a good, that's a good way to sum it up. Ev. You know, the pros have the caddies. We don't. Right. So that's, they're lucky in that sense, but there's a reason why they have the caddies. They're so good, but you're right. It's playing. They're playing for their livelihoods. We're just playing for the story we kind of come up with in our head. You know, what our reputation is, what our identity is, you know, we're able to, you know, go home and, <laughs> and, and still, you know, have a life outside of golf when their life is golf. So no, I love it. Ed. Like you said, it's always good to hear something as many, as much as we hear it from the great players in the world on this show, it's always refreshing. Um, and there's always a lot to, to kind of take out of it. So, yep. And I'll tell you what, 2023 was the year of the LPGA on the partial. And there, there's a little theme in this episode too, with LPGA talk and LPGA players and teachers. So I think we're uh, more to come there. Like you said. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. So if you see me looking away from the camera, I'm basically loading up the next soundbite um, while Sir is talking. In the moment. In case you're wondering, grinding. What's I'm looking at, right? All right. Episode 231 with Chris Trot, Trotty <sighs> Golf, as you know him from TaylorMade. March 12th, we recorded this. Episode 231. Great episode. Part of, again, another one, actually, a part of our uh, TaylorMade partnership. So. Let's play what Serm selected from Trotty. I wasn't very patient. I'm just not a very patient person. So that was a constant reminder for me. Like every yardage book I had would have like patience. Now, what that means in golfing terms is pick the flags you go for and don't be an idiot. And obviously, as time's gone on, you know, there was a great podcast with Harry Higgs and he wouldn't even some tournaments he was playing, he wouldn't even fire with a nine iron at a back flag if he didn't feel like he had his game. I was playing, I played in a qualifier for the Qatar Masters back in like early 2000. I played with the guy who went on to be rookie of the year on the European tour. And when we finished, I was leading. When we finished, I didn't get in. He just said to me, how much money you got in your bank? And I'm like, what, the, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you play millionaire golf. And I was like, what does that mean? And he said, there's not one flag you didn't go straight at today. Like, how do you expect to get in the tournament when we're playing for one spot and you're bringing double bogey into play on every hole because you're firing at every flag. Like that's, and that's what I mean by patience. That's good. That's good stuff right there, Ev. <laughs> He's such a good storyteller. Right? It's funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's like, what, what do you mean? <laughs> Don't be an idiot. I love those things. He's saying, what a great um, question. How much money do you have in your bank account? Cause you're playing <laughs> millionaire golf. Yeah. I think a lot so, of us are playing millionaire golf. Yeah, we are. And I, I, I so I, we talk about this idea of playing center, you know, center of the green, cons, you know, aggressive to conservative targets. Um, can't, can't be firing at flags all day. Um, 
And I think that's a really, he summed it up in a really, really important way. And there's a great mini tour player, but I, I, I do want to add to this Ev. So this is a little, this is, this is a little bit of a caveat and why I picked it. I want to explain to the listeners um, how this works actually, because this is what's really funny. Tell me if you agree. If I say to you, or if you said to me, okay, aim at the flag, I am going to look at the flag and that's my target. I'm going for the flag. That is my visualization. Now you say, Matt, on the next hole, aim the center of the green. I'm not aiming at the center of the green. I am aiming at a tree branch or a bunker edge behind the green for my visualization because what is actually the center of the green? So I think this is really important. You know, it's funny because if you you go with the flag, I don't know what you think of, but are you know, it seems like the flag is always going to encapsulate us as our target as opposed to something a tree branch or a leaf or a rake or an edge of a bunker directly behind it. (laughs) Um, So, you know, um, the point is, yes, we need to be not be going at flags unless we have short irons and we've got a lot of room. Most of the time we need to be thinking about the center of the green, but it's really about picking a spot, whether it's in front of you or if you're a person like me, it was more visual. I like to look out in the distance, really honing in on, like I said, that tree branch, um, that rake, that edge of the bunker, um, because center of the green, no, no, you're not looking at anything. You don't know what exactly is the center of the green. You right. know, there's nothing sticking out of the center of the green. There's a flag sticking out of the flag. Right. So um, I wanted to elaborate on this a little bit. And I'm sure this has been discussed in episodes with guests, but I wanted to add this in Ev. So um, because the concept is so important, be patient, you know, be smart with your iron play. Um, Think about the long game, you know, in terms of the big picture of your, of your round, but you got to know how to aim properly and think about the center of the green. So. I love this. It's so funny. You say this because we haven't talked about it explicitly but you probably saw in my video with Brett McCabe when I went out to see him in Birmingham, he said this exact thing to me. Hole one, I actually hit a good drive off the first tee, no warm up, And I'd like 100 yards to the center of the green. A little uh, three-quarter, 52, which is what I like to do with a 100-yard shot. And he goes, wait a second. Middle of the green is a pretty big target. Where are you actually aiming? Yeah. And I said, oh, okay, well, there's that tree trunk in the back. And there's this little like yellow, there was like an orange piece of tape. I think they were doing some construction. He goes, love that spot. It's perfect. And I hit it right at that spot. Yeah. Right. It, it may have been the, I may have heard it there too. Yeah. So that's great. I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah. Because I've, like, um, I've heard this too, but this is how I, yeah. So it's, it's, there, it, there's such a difference there. Yeah, 100%. And you know, the fun thing is, maybe that's, we never said this either, but maybe that's a reason why it's really hard to aim at the, quote, middle of the green all round. It's because you don't know what you're aiming at. And I would say this, sir, of all the I'll podcasts we've done. I'll take a step further in a second, actually. That's a great point. Go ahead. Well, it is, when you see the flag, okay, done, got it. I'm going for the flag, right? Right. When you're looking at the center of the green or the left part of the green, you got to find a target. This is about mental energy, which is so exhausting when you play golf. Mm-hmm. You want to play really high level golf. You know, it's like, oh my God, you're, is it this? Is it, is it the lip? It, do I like that? It, and that's what makes it tough. Yeah. Can you guys sense? <laughs> He's getting fired up over here. Can you sense it? I told you I was fired up for this yeah. episode. Okay. <laughs> now, here's the last thing I'll say on this soundbite. We've only almost done 300 episodes on this podcast over seven yeah. years. I would say the one thing that everyone can do better that will 100% 100% lead to lower scores is playing more conservative. Like if you actually focused all round on like what club am I comfortable with? What club... Am I not having second guesses with what club can I get in play and what is the fattest area of the fairway 
knowing my dispersion and my miss. And then how can I aim to a part of the green using a target, like you said, so that I'm giving myself the best chance to hit this green, knowing my misses, knowing my yardage dispersion. Um, and I think back to this past year on the few times that I actually did ride that par train and really get into a groove. It's when I was getting really focused on course management again yeah, and being conservative. Right. And I think right. that's and, what this is about, right? Well, and, and, and to Trotty's point, he's not a, this was, this is a great player who is just not a patient player has to become a, you have to develop patience. That takes work guys. Yeah. And right. <laughs> Love it. So, yeah. I thought that, that was, was a good great. one. Episode 231 with Trotty. If you like that, go check out the full episode if you haven't already. And I'm just okay. crushing Fever Tree Club sodas. I'm opening another one. Wow. Bottle That's opener scary. at 12 o'clock. Don't worry, no gin in here. Also, I don't should, think you guys are hearing be. this. It's, but it's silly season, you know? Just to give you a little bit of more funny context, apparently there's something weird on Zoom where Serm is hearing me. I don't hear myself this way, so I'm assuming it's not in the recording, but apparently I sound like the Kevin McAllister slowed down deep voice on well, his talk man or whatever it was. Peter. Yeah, and you're Peter McAllister calling the Plaza hotel for it's oh, Peter, Peter, Peter McAllister, McAllister, the father. That's how I sound right now. <laughs> I wish I could we've got some weird zoom. I think Cermak has some incredible focus right now to be able to overlook this technical glitch and execute accordingly. So props to Serm. the end of the year, really ending the year on a high note. Thanks, All right. Peter. Episode 247. John Sherman, the author of Four Foundations of Golf. We've had him on many times after this. Um, simplifying the complexity of commitment. This was fun because we were like, we need to dig in on this idea of commitment. What does it mean to commit? What does it mean not to commit? And that's why I picked this sound, but I think it's so good. Go through like a a recap of your round the best you can like after you know right when the information's fresh i just kind of go through shots in my head and that's one of the questions i ask myself was there a shot today or shots where i did not feel comfortable over the ball and i had some like bad thoughts did that cause me to hit a poor shot or was it okay because you can still hit good shots with bad thoughts like that's just not yeah like that's another thing i want people to know like well, you can be scared you can be nervous i've played in I was happens all the time. <laughs> I won my club championship this year as a 36 hole final match play. I was eating a turkey sandwich in between the 18s, and all of a sudden I couldn't swallow. Mm. I was like, I was like, there's something happening. I'm like, what's going on here? And like obviously I was nervous, but it was okay. And I went out and played and like I just kind of dealt with that. And so like you can play good golf if you're nervous or don't have great thoughts. Like do I want you to have those all the time? No, but like, that's okay too. But I think when there's a pattern, getting back to my original point, when you start reviewing your shots after every round, if you start seeing a pattern saying like, oh, I hit five tee shots to the right and my pre-shot thought was don't hit it to the right. And that was just dominating my mind. Well, then that's something you're going to have to deal with in your pre-shot routine and mental rehearsals. Like that's not easy, but I'm always looking for patterns is my best answer to that question. Like, was there a pattern of me not being committed to shots and then having outcomes that were not so good in tandem with that? And and they're going to be highly correlated. Like you do need a, a certain level of commitment, obviously. Okay. So we've used this quote before on the podcast, but it's something of the sense that you can't learn without reflection. Sure. And I think this is one of the biggest mistakes. I've made it many times. We all do where you just kind of like something pops in. your. I've been laying in bed before and I think of something in my swing and I can't wait to go try it. Right. Yeah. You it makes that. no sense. Um, but how often do I actually reflect after a round? And make a little star on my scorecard of something happened here um, or under the double, what happened? And really think, what was I thinking in that moment? 
what were the moments that I was uncomfortable with? And why was I uncomfortable? Is it because I haven't practiced it? Is it because I'm scared of past mistakes? You know, I think this is something I'm going to be really focused on next this past, this next year is, okay, I know this is going to come up. I know I'm going to get nervous over a shot and I'm feeling tentative, right? So then what is my go-to plan when I feel tentative and my body is scared to either block one right or snap one left? It's a scary thing to step into when you're playing golf and looking at hazards. Like I know it's just golf, but it's can't deny it's still scary. So sure. that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. And it was one of the first times in a while that I actually said, okay, I know from watching myself on video now enough this year, I know what happens when I get tentative. I don't make a turn and I don't really get to my left side at all. I get really armsy. And so one way that I'm going to combat or deal with this feeling to use John's word is I was looking at a 220 yard par three and I had a four iron in my hand and I'm starting to feel tentative. You know, it's a little bit cold. It's a long par three. And all I focused on was making a big turn and kind of leaning into my left side through the transition, just like really just like loading basically. Right. And I hit it to five feet and I made birdie yeah, on one of the hardest holes in the course. And I really laughed to myself because that was one of the first times that I felt that the tentativeness come into my body. So the, the stress or the anxiety, I didn't rush to try and avoid the feeling, but I acknowledged it. And I said, okay, this is a pattern to John's point. What do I know that I need to do? I need to make a full turn and really load here. I might still miss it, but this is going to be, give me my best chance to deal with this feeling right now. And I made yeah. birdie. And that was really yeah, eye-opening to me. It's a great example. I've, no, I like that a lot. Um, we haven't talked right, about that, actually. Four iron 220. I mean, I don't know if there was... It's a hard shot, whether there's water, there's no water, wind, yeah. no wind. It's a hard shot. Long irons are hard to hit. Um, so you kind of felt this is difficult. I'm not good at this shot. Tension comes in. You kind of, but you also kind of realigned a little bit. All right, I need to make a big turn. And you did it. Yeah, I think that's really important. One thing I'll add, add to, I'm really glad you picked this. Um, we have to recognize the shots that we don't like, like the 400 from 220 or the 10 yard pitch over the bunker. Right. And then we're thinking about the round after and why we didn't execute those shots. Those are just tough shots to hit from a physical perspective. The other thing I would, the other moments we want to really be aware of, especially for uh, just hammering this on for our listeners. Hey, I made a birdie on five. I made a birdie in a while. I'm on the sixth hole and I'm feeling like, oh my God. Yeah. I'm feeling a little nervous. Got to protect this birdie. Right. <laughs> You know, so we want, we always want to be aware of, you know, where our mind goes. And then oftentimes then you hit a high right shot. Cause you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to hit it out of play, you know, and then you make a bogey or a double. So these deep dives after the round, like John said, they gotta be real. You gotta, you know, you gotta really dig in to those moments of uncertainty and uncomfortableness because that's golf. Isn't it How crazy though? It? We're gonna we have to we have to deal with it. It's kind of crazy though, if you think about it. Like anything that you are trying to achieve a goal in, let's use everyone's work as an example, right? Most people have jobs where they have to set goals, they have meetings to talk about the goals. At the end of the year, they discuss how close or if they exceeded them, and then they set new ones. That is reflection, that is checking in. And so many of us try and I'm kind of having like an aha moment right now. It's like kind of blows my mind how much I work at this game and how much I want to play better golf yet. How few amount of times I actually sit down after a round and truly reflect. I usually kind of treat around as black or white, good or bad. I had some good shots. I had some bad shots. I can't believe I messed that up. And then you kind of move on. 
and you kind of work on something in the swing or the range, but you're not really reflecting on like the areas of discomfort and what you did when you felt that. Right. And how your process was affected. Yeah. So, where you, so yeah, no, That's I think big. this is, this is the hard work and this is why John Sherman has got to where he's got in his golf career. You know, it wasn't, a, yeah. it wasn't, a, it wasn't a plus handicap player in high school and college. Look where right. he is now. So, right. Great yeah, choice. Plus three. All right. Episode 232, your third soundbite with our friends at Vision 54, Pia and Lynn, um, former coaches of Annika Sorenstam, among many others. And um, this was my probably one of my favorite conversations of the year. So I'm glad you picked this. Yeah. Let's see what soundbite Sir Mac shows. Episode 232. Both the ball is sitting still <laughs> and it's not reactionary. It's tough. And yeah. our, our profession, we're pollute with thinking and pieces <laughs> of the swing. Most, I love how, yeah, go ahead. most golfers yeah, has never true. learned to, okay, I can work in my technique and swing and practice session at home and all of that. But when I go out to be a performer in the golf course, I need to play with the technique I got. So the play box is all about learning. I made a decision. I'm going to step into being an athlete seeing, feeling, sensing, whatever works for me to the finish of my swing that helps my technical motion. Yeah. So, and most people need to do a waggle and stay in motion. Yeah. We love all that. So I we, mean, an, an analog yeah. state is actually yeah. preferable. I mean, it's yeah. it's part of a so, good performance Some state. keep more a technical field. They maybe feel their shoulders are rotating, but they're not thinking about it anymore. So the main thing That's is it. learning. learning. Yeah, it's exactly not cognitive that. thinking. It's stepping into something sensory to the finish that helps your motion or stroke. Yeah, that was a great interview. Uh, they're just so incredible and so impressive in what they've built and getting us to think about what's possible in this game, right? Birding yep. every hole. Um, yeah, so what I love about this, Evan, what got me thinking about and is, you know, you, when you're warming up for your round, if you like to warm up, <laughs> and maybe you're hitting it a little further left than you're used to, or a little further right, or a little higher, a little lower. Just take notes. It's who you are. It's who you brought to the dance today. Embrace it. Don't fight it. And then let sensory kind of take over as opposed to technical, right? So you got to go and you got to go play and you got to feel your bones, feel your body. And if, you know, if I'm a fader, but I'm hitting some draws today, you know, this may be something you got to play with, you know, or balls coming out a little lower. Don't, don't hit the panic signal. Like we always do. Or yeah. you hit one left right away. Okay. You know, maybe you're a little fast in your hands today. So you're going to be playing, you're going to be aiming a little right and playing a draw. So to me, that's what it is. Embrace being an athlete and embrace being sensory. Um, finding your feel, the feels change every day when we play our bones, our body, and just, and just, just deal with it. You know, don't just deal with it and just play with it and, and it, you know, see what happens, but yeah. it's difficult, right? Because I think, you know, as we've talked about, you don't like what you see. You don't like how you feel. You can spiral quick. Yeah. When golf so hard because we feel different every time we get there. <laughs> Totally. And I, I can hear some of our passengers listen to this and be like, I think there's a lot of people listening to this term that don't come to the course and have a draw instead of a fade. I think what happens for a lot of our passengers is you shank a few or you okay. top a you top a few or you block three drives off the reservation or you snap hook a few. And this idea of playing with what you got when the result is that poor, like unplayable, right? Um, it's hard for someone, I think, to hear that and know exactly what to do. How could I play with what you got? But I think the takeaway for me to kind of round that about with the passenger that might be thinking that is how much of those things are being caused by compensation upon compensation right like padre carrington said that's what he works on the most with dr bob Rotella, 
who we've had on the show, our number one episode, where if you miss one left and then the next time you hit, you're aiming more right or you're trying not to miss it left and then you block it and then you do something to then not block it, <laughs> your real swing isn't actually coming out, right? It's just compensation upon compensation. Now, I'm going to say this is probably the hardest thing that we're going to talk about today because it is normal to want to go into fix it mode and emergency mode and the sirens are on and why the hell did I just top a drive, right? So it makes sense that you would do something to address that the next time you have driver in your hand. But I think what Lynn and Pierre are saying is your play box is your play box. You can't be fixing things within your play box. You have to have sensory, not positional things. Going back to honestly what we talked about with about with John Sherman. Like you have to be able to reflect on what happened. What were you uncomfortable about? Did that cause one of these bad shots? Well, typically um, it does. Yeah. Right. I mean, and I would say for what the... is a sensory feel, not positional feel that I can lean on, whether it's making a full turn, whether it's staying in my posture, whether it's swinging better tempo. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say, you know, for if, you know, for the higher handicap player, you know, you're hitting, you're shaking it on the range, you're hitting high blocks or on the first couple holes because you were just full of tension. Right. right. So good players, better, lower handicappers are better for kind of recognizing tension and being able to manage it. Right. So, okay. I maybe Matt, maybe Sir Matt can, He's got to hit more draws than fades. Okay, but I'm from a 15 handicapper. You know when you're your best off when you have <laughs> the, when you have less tension, and you know, like you said, Ev, that's what you need to think about: less tension, making an athletic move as opposed to, hey, I need to fix my club face, need to work on my backswing, need to widen my stance. You know, right? And so, yeah, no, I thought it was, I thought I thought it's great. We have to keep reminding. Our, reminding ourselves of that the yeah. whole term fixing it on the fly there's a way to do it right and it's and not i think it's a good with mechanics right i think it's a good question am i playing golf swing right now or am i playing golf am i getting positional or is this sensory right. and then catch yourself and instead of turning an entire round into a shit storm maybe do it for a hole or two right you and can't then get make back. an athletic turn into your right side on a 220 yard par three without managing tension right if your tension filled over the ball you can't make that turn right yep 100 percent. all right that was episode 232 with lynn and pia great episode to go back and listen to my third point i knew i was going to pick this one and i know it's easy in this exercise at the end of the year to pick our biggest guests right pick the biggest names sure 252 episode 252 i did not do that this is a guest a passenger actually named Brandon, who Loyal DM'd passenger. us and said, hey, man, I just had this experience. I think I want to quit the game. Do you have anything that I should listen to or do you have any advice? And I said, Brandon, stop right there. Let's invite you aboard the train and let's talk it through. Because that's what this is about. This is a community. Yeah. Okay. This mm -hmm. is this yeah. is not Spe this is the podcast hosts of what we do. Yeah. This is not podcast hosts and listeners. This is a community. Let me, I, Absolutely. I, we don't say that enough. That's true. Ev. And that's a big difference between our show and others is right. you guys love and appreciate episodes with someone like you as much as you do Sean Foley and a PJ tour pro. Right. So I'm just going to play it and then we'll go from there. So, so far I'm realizing number one, Brandon needs a process. You need a task to lean into. Whereas when you struggle, you get into people first, opinions of others, a failure of your own, right? Because I just want to make this clear. Golf wasn't making you miserable, by the way. Mm -hmm. It was feeling like a failure that was. 100%. Golf was the personification of it, but it was feeling like a failure because of the expectation that you should be somewhere else. Yep. And you don't really have a tool at your disposal to enjoy it more or get frustrated less 
and you don't have a tool when you're not performing well and on the course, you just go straight to your swing. To me, that's a recipe for frustration yep. because people are telling you to enjoy it. You don't know how to, and you want to have better shots, but you don't have a process to lean in on. Does that make sense? Absolutely does. I have experienced this. I have lived this and it is just so important that number one, it's normal to feel like you're a failure if you've historically been in a certain place and suddenly you feel lost out there. Every golfer has felt lost on the golf course. Okay. What we identified with this episode, episode 252, if you've ever really struggled, if you ever felt like quitting, you got to listen to this episode because we unpack how Brandon got to where he was. And it was a lot of self judgment focused on others, no process, no real knowledge of what he does and why he does it. And then he DM'd us after this episode. He shot an 81 and like an 84 the next week. Yeah. Um, turned it right around by not changing anything, by just kind of showcasing a mirror of the pattern that he had. Now, the other thing I'll say before I kick it to you, sir, is. 2024 for me, I'll talk to this at the end, but I'll give a little teaser of it now, needs to be, you can't do it on your own for me. Like, yeah. I am so done with this whole, like, try game. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. 2024 for me is going to be getting help. And Brandon, I think, is a good example of, if, if you feel lost, get a professional. Like sometimes you don't know what you're doing. Sometimes you don't know what your tendencies are. Sometimes you don't know why your miss is the miss that it is. Sometimes you don't know what sensory field to lean in on because you don't have the knowledge of what you do when you did play poorly. Right. So I think that's so important. If you're feeling lost, number one, listen to this episode because it might be mental, all mental, and you might be able to turn it around simply by having a process and changing your mindset a bit. But if it's not that, and it's mechanical plus mental, you got to get a coach that can help give you a plan and know what to lean on. So I think those two things are so important with this. But this episode was one of my favorites of the year, episode 252. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, it's as real as it gets, right? Uh, I think you're right. I mean, what he needed was just to come on and <laughs> talk about what's going on. I think he was able to really just let go and be vulnerable and, you know, maybe be, be ashamed at the start of the episode and then be very proud towards the end of the episode. And, um, golf is so hard. And, uh, sometimes we, it's more, and it's like you said, it's, it's what happens. It's more than just getting mad or getting sad or getting angry. Um, <laughs> it just doesn't go away. So I'm with you. Ev. I mean, you can't if if you want to be really good at this game you can't you, you can't do it on your own you know um you got to manage not working with too many different people and i think we, we've talked about that too but it's good to have a swing coach you know it's it's good to talk to others about your emotions out there like brandon right and like and i think he learned a lot what we had to say based on our experience and then he implemented them and he's a whole new guy whole new player right so I think this is a great pick. I have, like you said, this, these are one of those special episodes. It kind of sums up what the part train community is all about. Yeah. Real stories from real players. <laughs> Heard of it. Uh, that was episode 252. I want to quit golf. Now this next one was one of our favorites of the year. Just a classic Cermak special brings on a guy from Chicago. He grew up with not many people know his name. And he spews out some of the greatest truths we heard in seven years, right? Episode 249 with Jared Steger, minuscule things that make a monumental difference for any golfer. Let's see what clip you picked here. Bob Rotella said this really well. And like Patrick Cantley talks about this too, is like golf such a weird game, right? Like when you play, when you're actually playing 18 holes, right? You, you rarely ever hit the same shot twice in a row. Like rarely, 
but it's the one sport we just rake a ball, we hit it, we rake a ball, we hit it. And he's like, how many times, Bob Rotella said, you know, how many times you see a tour player like hit a shot and it just fades and it goes underneath a tree. And then afterwards they sit there and they're working on their motor pattern, they're swinging. And he's like, that could be the worst thing because the next shot you have to hit is a rope draw. Right. Totally different like motor pattern, either. right? Mm. Totally. And he's like, you're ingraining something that is completely no relevance to the next shot, which is the most important shot. And it's like, man, that was a light switch for me. <laughs> like, so I don't give it it's good. I don't care what, what this looks like. By the way, shout out to Jared Steeg or Jay Steegs. Um, was that the wedding? He's at the wedding. Um, I never heard it said like that. Right. And he said, I think Rotella and Cantley talked about it. And then, so it, it, we've all done it, Ev, right? You make that bad swing <laughs> and you're just doing practice swings after trying to feel a position. What did I do wrong? Oh, it's not, it's not that move. It's this move. Mm-hmm. And then you get up, or like you said, <laughs> you've got to hit a 160 yard low left slinging draw or some high, try to hit a high right block or you have to pitch out sideways, whatever. It, it's going to be a very d- different shot than you had. Yeah. And you're so caught up, you know, it's okay to be mad, right? It's okay to, you know, show some emotion, but you've got to be thinking about that next shot in a healthy way. Like you've got to, all right, get mad and okay, what do we got coming up? You know, and start thinking about what's ahead um, as opposed to being just so stuck, stuck in the past. And I think, again, he talked about tour, tour players. Anybody's guilty of it, playing golf swing on the golf course, working on golf swing, working on positions, you know, when it's just an obstacle course out there that requires all kinds of moves and all kinds of swings and feels. Um, and it's amazing what I, the last thing I'll say about this, why this is so good for our listeners. And we've talked about this, Evan, I think you had a period of time like this. Why can't I hit that simple shot down the fairway or into the green? But when I'm faced with in the trees, my feel and my creativity comes out, you know, mm-hmm. cause I just got to see it, feel it, use my hands and trust it. And I hit this great 160 yard low draw to the front of the green. It's two different people. It's two different golfers. And we need to we need to understand why we need to pull from that when we're mm-hmm. trying to hit that driver off the tee or that six iron, you know, at that left branch over the bunker to the center of the green. Yeah. So I, I really I really felt that as Jared explained that. So uh, great stuff from Jared. Yeah, Thoughts? that was episode 249. I agree. I think the cool thing is we always hear the next shot's the most important shot, but you don't think about how your your fix mode from the last shot has nothing to do with the next one. Exactly. I think that's cool. Um, that's a good one. I don't even remember that. That's why this yeah. is cool to go back, right? You really dig. Yeah. 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 No. All right. Next episode. I know we're nearing. We each got two two more each. I think. Um, this one I had to throw in. This kind of defined my year, right? Sure. Living a month in Scotland, a dream come true. And I did exactly what you're not supposed to do. And I learned a ton from what not to do. And Learning you guys are welcome. Okay. I flew across the pond, <laughs> I did the wrong stuff just to teach you what not to do. That's how much I care about the passengers. Let's listen to the clip that I picked here. <laughs> Incredible. You have to find clarity in as many places as you can. You have to find clarity with the type of shots you're going to hit. You have to have clarity with a certain fairway finder you have to have. You have to have clarity with the shots you're going to play around the green. You have to have clarity with the type of swings you're going to play, the clubs, some distances. You have to have clarity on what direction you're going. I had zero clarity and for nine rounds. Yeah. And it was a really great crash course on just playing without commitment. And that's the opposite of how you play good golf. So I hope a lot of people can learn um, from this experience. Cause to me, it's so eye opening. It's so eye opening. I'm probably going to play golf differently when I come home. 
just letting it out post trip. <laughs> yeah, you just in it. <laughs> or no, you or you were. There. I was in Italy. <laughs> you were in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was in Italy. Guys making fun of me because I'm staring at the ocean in Italy, talking about Scotland. Um, but we did a whole episode with John Sherman on commitment, right? And I think that yeah. proves that this idea and this concept of commitment can be quite vague. And sometimes you don't always know when you're committed and when you're not. So when I got back from Scotland, I realized it's actually clarity. And I realized I wasn't getting any of it. Now, in the episode, episode 275, I'd highly recommend listening back to it. There's a ton of variables, right? Wind, types of shot I'm going to hit, club selection, blind shots I'm not used to playing. I don't know the courses, um, different turf, uh, swing stuff. Um, different types of shots I'm not used to hitting around the greens, different clubs I'm not used to be chipping with, um, what I'm used to hitting versus what the shot calls for. All of those variables was basically leading to me having no clarity on what I was trying to do. And I was walking into shots, basically just trying to like play golf swing the whole time without any clarity on what I'm supposed to do. And that is a recipe for disaster because your brain needs direction to guide your body on what to do. So why do you think when you have a partner or a caddy and they say, what's a good shot look here, look like here, or what are you trying to do here? And you say, you have absolute clarity and you say, well, that pins on the left. There's no point missing left. I have the whole green to the right. I'm going to aim at the right bunker and I'm going to draw it back to the center of the green. If it doesn't draw, I'll be on the right side of the green or a green side bunker, which is totally fine. Um, but there's no point bringing the water on the left into play, right? right? And you step into that shot and you normally, you don't always execute it, but you probably have a better result than if you step into the shot, not really clear on where you want to go and you make mental mistakes from a lack of focus. And the one thing we don't talk enough about is we always talk about focusing on golf, not golf swing. But when you focus on golf swing, you lose sight of all the other details that you need to be focused on. And we you pointed this way. out to me Yeah, in Arizona. You're like, you don't really, you're not really focused on what you're trying to do. You're I'm, I'm, I'm playing faster to try and, you know, block out the doubt tension and the and negative thoughts tension yeah. and, and I'm trying to rush, but actually what I needed to do is slow down and get clarity. So I would actually say, this is my biggest lesson from Scotland. If you guys maybe don't be as focused on commitment as much, Get focused on clarity. Get clarity on your club selection. You can't have commitment if you don't have clarity. Right. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I just think it's easier to understand. Like right. if right. you're not sure yep. when, how to be committed, just find clarity on the type of shot you're trying to hit. And now you're committed. Have a pl I mean, have a plan, right? Yeah. And sometimes the plan might, you know, might not work out. Or like you said, you may not execute, but when you, I love how you talk that through Ev, right? Like, Pins on the left, trouble left. I'm going right center of the green. Draw is great. If it doesn't, I'm okay. You know, and you could be out there and you could be deciding, hey, is an eight or a seven, right? And let's say you pulled a seven and you hit it great, but it went over the green. Okay. You, the plan wasn't perfect. Bad right. decision. But right. you had the plan. You had clarity. You committed. Those are the moments. Of, okay. But next hole, you're going to pull the eight, right? And you're going to hit right. the 10 feet. So have a plan, gain clarity. It's the only way you can commit. I really love that, Evan. I think that's, like you said, it was an eye opener for you. Yeah. You know, but you reflected. Like right. you talked about. Deep that's reflection. That's the power of the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm proud of you for that. Yeah. It's fun how these things are kind of, I, that's why I love these episodes because they blend together. You start to see some themes. Yep. Um, all right. This is your last one. Also, okay. the month in Scotland was episode 275. This is 280. Another Chicago local that's just dropping truth bombs all over the train. Episode 280 with Larry Blatt. Let's get to which soundbite you picked from this awesome episode. You know, when you're not playing well, it's so easy to say by the 12th or 13th hole, it's just not my day, right? You know, you made some good swings, but you got some bad bounces, a couple of lip outs, 
you know, and you just can't do that. Now, when you finished the round, you look back and you gave everything you got and, and you were present, <clears throat> you fought. Yeah, maybe it just wasn't my day. But when you're in it, when you're in the round, that you can't say those words. You just can't. Right. No, <laughs> because what if you, okay, you're having a bad round through 13 holes, but what if something clicks in those last five holes and say you birdie three of your last five, and then you take that to your next round or your next competition? That's that's how you get better. You get better through the adversity and the tough rounds. And then when you have, you're having that tough day and you come back from it in that round, that's a, I don't think there's a better feeling. And then you can take that going forward. So that that's huge. And that's, you know, that's why you got to be mentally tough and have that fight, even when it's not going your way. Some great fight. stuff in there. Yeah, I got to fight. I mean, what was the name of that episode? Of? Back against the wall? Yeah, the transformational back against the wall mentality. That's Larry Blatt, right? Larry Blatt, shout out to Larry. He's down in Florida right now, chasing the dream, um, the mini tours. He is best when he's his back's against the wall. He has to, right? Early in the episode, he talks about, you know, I've got to convince myself that I, you know, that I've got to fight today. It's going to be hard. And that mentality helps him settle some down and, and really play good golf. Uh, I had to add the part in with myself there because like, it really, really was a big theme for me this year when I was playing mm. like guys, you cannot, you cannot tell yourself this isn't my day out there. Yeah. You cannot say that. <laughs> really in anything, by the way, right. not just golf. Like you can't submit to saying this is just a bad day. Like, like it's just not meant for me. Um, right. Because you, you've talked about it. You know, you might, yeah, you might struggle on the front nine and maybe even 15 holes, but then you make a birdie or two coming in and it's like, I found something. Right. I made that round, not an 88. I made it an 85. Um, and I didn't think I could. And so when you, when we tell it like what well, it can be your day, there can be positivity. You can finish strong, but, but Ev, it's really difficult. Most of the time we're just ch like chalk this one up and you think you're not giving up, but you are. Yeah. You maybe you're still going through routine. You're still going through process, but mentally you've gave in a little bit and we have to fight. Like I told you, there's some of my great rounds this year were in bad weather. And one of them was, you know, coming off a, a bad front nine again, playing against a guy that I'd never met. It was a really good player. I was like, why is he beating you right now? Why are you like, why are you accepting this? Like, you know, <laughs> like we, this is not his day. You know, this is your day. Mm -hmm. And then you play a great back night. Now, again, like I said, who knows what it's going to happen. But it's a mentality of, and Larry has it. Larry carries it every day to fight, to be a back against the wall, to not give in, and just stop telling yourself this stuff, guys. Yeah. Stop, stop telling yourself that it's, it's just not your day. It can be your day. Yeah, I love that. And every day is different you, out there. I'm going to give you kind of a off the wall weird analogy, um, yeah. and it's very personal, but I'm going to give it anyways. Yeah. I asked my brother a couple years after his divorce. Would you have wanted me to tell you to not propose to your ex-wife? Because by the way, when he was telling me he was going to propose, I was like, yikes, should I say something or should I not? Because I didn't think she was right for him. She just wasn't a nice person. My brother's the sweetest guy in the world. And he told me, yes, that he would have preferred me to say something. Now, whether that's hindsight, truth, who knows? But the way that I've kind of reflected on it is I'm glad I didn't. Because you don't know what that relationship has created. You might see it as a failure because they didn't stay married. But you you can't try and say, I can't try and control or prevent my brother from the lessons he was meant to learn. Right? Like, he is probably going to become something different because of that. That's probably going to lead him to the right person or become the person that he was supposed to be. So mm. by saying that this is just a bad day, I think it's missing a big part of what am I supposed to learn from this? Right? Um, it's not just good or bad. It, it's like, 
I'm learn. I'm supposed to learn something from this. Right. I'm being challenged. This is happening for whatever you're thinking is. This is happening for a reason. God's right. testing me. Right. When you're out on the golf course. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, this is a challenging one today. I've gone double, double, double. <laughs> right. right. You know this. All right. Okay. This is and why did Tiger make so many cuts in a row? Right. Right. Because there's always hope mm -hmm. that back nine's coming, that center of the face to two feet's coming. But probably and because other I, people said this is a bad day and they correct. gave up and they started thinking of next week. Tiger did not. Right. It's, it's so difficult. Right. But we've got to find a way, you know, and for the listeners, a version of that. And right. I'm telling you, and you're going to, you're going to turn those 88s and 85s. You're going to, you're going to really latch onto that great finish and, you know, man, I was making a good turn there, man. That putt, my putting stroke felt so smooth on the last three holes. Keep yep. fighting. You keep yep. fighting. So I just, yeah, I love episode it. 280 <laughs> back against the wall with Larry Blatt. Awesome episode. Definitely go check that out if you haven't. All right. Last, my last one. Okay. Kind of a poetic yep. way to end today. Yeah. Let's um, hear it. Brett McCabe in Birmingham, episode 285. Oh, sure. I, I went that. to fly and see him. Let's see which one I picked. The game's hard. Life's hard. Like, to look at this like a puzzle not a mirror sure. look at this like a what's the challenge i have to face right now right now you have to face a way to get more enjoyment out of the game i can't make you enjoy shooting crappy golf better can't do it but if you can learn to start doing some better things okay that's fine Ooh. um you know people say oh tour players you know how are they whatever well there are a handful of tour players I know right now that are very not very happy about their year. Okay. They're not in great spots. I mean, there was a very high profile case of a client of mine, Billy Horschel, at the memorial. And what was so brilliant about that first round, post round news conference that he was crying on. Yeah. Was that reflected just every freaking competitor and golfer there is. Mm -hmm. I give Billy so much credit for doing that. But I also think that's why Billy is one of the best thing people we can learn from on the pga tour he's open he's honest he's vulnerable so, i think this is my favorite quote of the year golf yeah. is a puzzle not a mirror and look this is so funny we didn't design i again i didn't know your sound bites you didn't know mine right but this is like literally what we were just talking about it puts it in a bow so nicely it really does i mean i've played some of the worst golf in my life and at times i don't want to go out there at times i yeah. want to hang it up but I know that this is pushing me to learn and improve what I do so that hopefully there's others that are listening that come to our podcast, that hop aboard because they're frustrated. And maybe I can learn a couple things to help those people. And maybe even you'll learn a couple things from me. Usually I'm learning from you, but we learn from each other. And maybe... This experience is going to bring the best golf of my life for some reason. And I just had to go about it. I had to go through it, right? And anytime I'm feeling really down, it's because I see it as a mirror. Yep. And that's because we pour our hearts and soul into it. This game is part of our identities, but I don't think it has to be. And uh, I think that's one of my favorite quotes of the year. Episode 285. It certainly shouldn't be. Um, but it, beco it becomes our identity. But I love that quote. It is so good. It's just another. And also, Billy like, Horschel crying I, I, proves I, I, we I all go through it. Golf is such an obstacle. It's a, it's a physical and mental obstacle course, and like <laughs> you know, and like never ending. Like it's just right. Constant. It's just. Um, I love how that summed it up for perspective for you, Ev. And as you look into 2024, because you know we talked about our goals. Um, I think that's I think that's the quote you're going to lean on. Yeah. You know, and so I don't know if you, you know, if we want to sign off here with what the big goal is for each yeah. other as it relates to our 2024 season. So my big goal is this. I am done with feeling shame and doing this on my own. I'm done with trying things just to try them. I am going to get real help 
and I'm going to leave my ego at the door and I'm going to share all of it. I'm going to share my right. worst shots. I'm going to talk about my struggles. And I know I have a bit on this show, but I'm going to do it through social media, video, as well as this podcast to try and learn as much as I can and do it right. You know, I think we're lucky. We have access to a lot of great people and I'm going to leverage it and I'm going to actually get real lessons, regular lessons, get in a plan, learn about what I do, learn about why I feel this way in my body. Why, why do I have this miss? Why do I have those two big misses? What happens when I top it? You know, like, and I'm going to share it. And, and that's what I'm committed to. I'm committed. You know, I've always said I want to get better, but I don't actually like, I've never really. What does that mean? My, right. Yeah. yeah. I've never actually like, committed what are the steps I've actually got to take to do that? I've just done the same stuff. I, I just hit balls and look, I'll tell you this, sir. I'm like, I have never been one to not work. Like I, sometimes I'd go to the range five times a week. Just looking on for something, just looking to find something so that I can and go. That's, right. that's the problem. Well, you, it's not about working hard with you. It's about working smart. That, right. I mean, we heard this a lot. That's of it. You start, that's it. Working hard is one thing. Working smart is another. Right. right. So I have the work ethic. I have the commitment, but I need to get smarter with it. Yep. And that's what I'm going to do in 2024. I love that. Ev. There's going to be a lot of good conversations around this and your and your progress. Um, you know, for me, Ev, we've talked about it. Uh, yeah. You know, my goal is to play a competitive, you know, playing a competitive yes. tournament or two. Um, you know, uh, I'm actually going to the range tomorrow. First time hitting balls uh, in almost two months. You obviously know about some of these potential swing changes I'm going to work on. But whether the swing changes happen or don't happen, I'm going to play in a tournament or two. And that means I'm going to dedicate myself to practice. I'm going to caddy for you. I'm going to fly out. Yeah, we got to look at the tournament schedule and <laughs> it's going to be fun. But uh, yeah, that's my goal. But my the goal around this is I've, I need to just, like you, put the practice in, smart practice. Yeah. But, you know, these next two months, we're hitting balls once or twice a week, you know, and we're putting in the time. And, and, and let's see, see it as lead. a puzzle. Let's not see it as a mirror. You've got a ton of, of exactly. old stuff from being a competitive player that's going to come back up. I've got a bunch of old stuff from the the lowest handicap I've been compared to where I am now. And we both want to perform not only for ourselves, but for this community. Um, but that's not always, that doesn't always help us get there. So we're going to yeah. see it. Let's also commit to seeing it as a puzzle and getting smarter. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to have a little fun with it. So let's have fun. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there you go, right? Twenty uh, twenty three. It's been a hell of a year. Yeah, what um, a year! Some just amazing conversations, some amazing guests, some amazing things we were able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, playing got together, married. got married, you know, and the travel you did. So another good one in the books, guys. But here's a twenty twenty four. Lots cooking. So yeah, thank you guys uh, from the bottom of our hearts for hopping aboard this year. It means the world. And, um, yeah, I think 2024 could bring even better stuff, um, and conversations and hopefully all of our best golf in 2024. So, um, what you guys can do is check the description of this show. I'll have the episodes, uh, listed and linked there. So if you, if one of these sound bites sound good to you, you can go back and, and re-listen or listen for the first time to those episodes. And uh, no matter how much you start to identify with your game or start to play golf like a millionaire, what do they got to do, sir? Just enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride, guys. We'll see you in the new year.